Welcome to the program, The Biofilm Associated Impact of Surgical Outcomes. My name is Paul Studley. I'm Director of the Campus Microscopy and Imaging Facility and Professor in Departments of Microbial Infection and Immunity in Orthopedics at The Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. So the, for the program information, today's program is approved for one hour of CME, CME, AAPA, and CPME credit. It's been provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and HMP company. And it is supported by an educational grant from Next Science Group. So the learning objectives of my part of the presentation, we're going to, in this program, we're going to explore um, and investigate gaps in evidence for timely treatment of biofilm in the immediate inter intraoperative period explore um, some of the issues that need to be considered in developing performance standards for antibiofilm therapeutics. Um, assess data supporting the need for definitive antibiofilm treatment at the time of surgery. Examine approaches to evaluating new surgical antibiofilm technology. So we'll start off with um, looking at gaps in evidence for timely treatment in the immediate and post-operative period. In this section, we'll, be, we'll look at some various issues um, in diagnosing and treating biofilm infections, and I'll be using a number of case studies and case series to illustrate some of these issues. However, before we get started, some things I'd like you to think about in terms of these challenges. One, there is no definitive biomarker for biofilm at the present time. There's no medical imaging modality for biofilm, i.e., we can't detect it inside the body like we can with uh, solid uh, tumors. Biofilm can be present but can be asymptomatic for extended periods. And even susceptible bacterial species become highly tolerant of antibiotics when in a biofilm. So possibly even a clinical, uh, a clinical isolate and an antibiogram uh, might be of limited use when we try to figure out what antibiotics might be um, used for biofilm, even if we do culture those organisms. There's no strict academic definition for biofilm, so in the biofilm world, even academicians like myself have certain questions about how to precisely define biofilms. And from the clinical side of things, there's no international classification of diseases, ICD codes for biofilm. So this makes reporting of biofilm um, infections um, anecdotal at best. So I want to begin with by so walking you through some of the um, some introduction to biofilms and illustrating uh, some of these issues which I've just discussed. So when bacteria are in biofilms, even susceptible strains become highly antibiotic tolerant. So here's a table of just a few organisms, which shows the uh, the conventional MIC microbial inhibitory concentration and MBC uh, minimum uh, biocidal concentration. Um, on the, on the, uh, the middle two columns, um, uh, where it says planktonic. And this shows uh, different antibiotics against different organisms. We have gram-positive organisms, we have gram-negative organisms, and we have a, um, uh, at the very top is an emerging MRSA strain, uh, four micrograms per mil for its MBC, that's a thousand-fold reduction. And we can see as we go down the table, we have four, two, two, eight, sixteen, and sixteen. To the right of that, is what happens when these organisms form a biofilm. And we can see much higher concentrations. And in fact, for the MRSA strain and the Staph epidermidis, um, and even the P. acnes, we couldn't get a three log reduction with any concentration of antibiotics uh, that were used. Similar story for the gram negatives. Much more difficult to kill. Uh, they have a much higher tolerance of antibiotics when they're present as biofilms. So I'm going to run through a case series as a learning example of some of the issues with chronic biofilm infections. And in this case, I'm going to be talking about biofilms associated with hernia repair and biofilms associated with infection of surgical repair materials, in this case, sutures and meshes. And so, uh, so a hernia is a protrusion of an organ and tissue through an opening its surrounding walls, and so this can be, um, this can be accidental, but it also can be uh, performed um, from surgery um, associated with uh, gastric bypass surgery, for example. 
hundreds of thousands of these surgeries are performed per year in the United States alone. And up to 15% of all elective surgical patients will develop a surgical wound infection. And sometimes, depending on the uh, location, rates as high as 30% are not uncommon. Now, for um, hernia specifically, to repair the hernia, as, uh, materials such as meshes, meshes and sutures are often used in the repair. And these can then provide a nidus for infection for biofilm, as we're going to see in the following slides. So here's a uh, pre-op uh, and uh, intraoperative uh, example of a patient who has developed um, surgical site um, infection. Uh, this is following um, open um, gastric bypass surgery. And in this case series, we're going to be looking at a series of um, 19 patients. And we can see um, on the preoperative image on the left that the skin is um, red. We can see that there's a protrusion um, of sutures actually coming up through the skin, and um, there, there is um, swelling, uh, edema in the, in the general area. Now, if we move uh, to the middle image, here's an intraoperative image of um, uh, Sandeep Kathu. Uh, Dr. Kathu is a general surgeon that I collaborated with on this um, case study. And on the right-hand side, we can see an example of, in this case, uh, some of the suture material that were removed from this patient and then examined in the laboratory. Here's an example of a mesh. On the left side, we see a patient intraoperative. Again, we see the, uh, the redness. We see the swelling. We can see the, um, uh, the draining sinus. This is erupted um, through the abdomen. And then immediately to the right, we can see the mesh that was pulled out. And this mesh was about six, six inches uh, by six inches inside the patient. And so a very large surface area for colonization. It was a plastic mesh, a woven mesh. Um, it was permanent mesh. And it's put in to hold the abdominal wall in place. To, to the right of that, another example of sutures which have protruded through the skin. Um, and we can see um, uh, in, in panel called A, we can see um, the preoperative um, image. And to the right, we can see the intraoperative image of the, um, of the sutures uh, protruding through the um, abdominal wall. Now let's take a look. When we took these, uh, when we took these um, specimens, we brought them into the lab. We can put them under a confocal microscope. This is a highly specialized microscope where we can look for the presence of bacteria and biofilms on fully hydrated samples in real time. And we can do this on live specimens. So in this case, what we've done is we stained the bacteria with a, with a um, live dead stain. It stains the bacteria green, live bacteria green, and dead bacteria are red. Now, in some cases, as in panel A, the suture material itself was autofluorescent, and it shows up somewhat conveniently as red. And so we can see the red strands of the woven. Uh, this is a braided suture, and we can see the individual strands of the braids. And then in between the strands of the braids in green, as shown by the white arrows, we see patches of small dots, which are bacterial biofilms. Each of those dots is about one micron. Um, in length, so about one, one millionth of a millimeter. If we go to panel B, we can see a, um, a higher magnification of the biofilm attached to that suture. They're green, so they're live. So these are live bacteria that were associated with the suture. And the patient, um, as you can imagine, had been on multiple courses of antibiotics, yet the bacteria were still on the, um, on the suture. And then if we go through panels C, D, E, and F, we can see other examples um, from different patients where we can see bio patches of biofilm on the suture um, material. In and it's not just the sutures. In panel E, we see a patch of biofilm which is growing around the surrounding tissue, fibrous sheath, which is associated with the, um, with the sutures. So it's not just on the foreign body itself that the biofilm grows, but also on the fibrous sheath. Now, one thing I'd like you to, um, to, to, to learn from or to take away from this image is when you see the uh, preoperative images, you imagine that the whole suture, the whole mesh is going to be completely covered with biofilm.
there's obviously a very um, strong uh, host immunoreaction to this infection. But when we actually get to the lab, we don't see that the whole material is covered with biofilm. We see very small patches, very small patches, um, sometimes no more than 10 to 100 cells, between 10 to 100 microns of biofilm on these sutures. So it really enmeshes. So it really is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So in the next slide, here's an example showing that, uh, illustrating the point that biofilms can be multi-species. So it's not just Staph aureus or Pseudomonas or Klebsiella pneumoniae. Bacteria can grow together when they're in a biofilm. And in this case, we've used an, uh, a sophisticated staining um, technique to show different organisms in different colors. And then we can see the host tissue um, or the um, um, sutures um, in the background. Uh, sutures are usually represented in uh, blue um, or red in these images. But we can see the bacteria quite clearly as red and green dots. Um, uh, rods and cocci um, on these um, materials. And each of these images show uh, are, are examples of where we can see the, the biofilm are multi-species. So now this adds further complexity because it's not only just one organism with one set of antibiotics that we might need to consider, but if we, pres if we prescribe, um, say, vancomycin, or if the surgeons prescribe vancomycin, say, for Staph aureus, but there's some Pseudomonas there, we, the, the Staph aureus could be killed, and then the Pseudomonas can proliferate. And this is one of the issues. And it's not just two organisms, um, whole, whole se uh, second generation, uh, or next generation sequencing shows that there can be as many as 10, 20, or even hundreds of different types of organisms in some of these um, infections. And so it becomes much more complex than a single organism causing a single infection. Here's an example from one, um, from one case of uh, multiple organisms which were um, cultured, uh, coagulated negative staph, enterococcus, cocci, diploids, and uh, different organisms were cultured at different time periods um, in the infection, and depending on the, uh, the, the, the different samples which, which were taken, the fluids and the tissues. Now, these data can be explained multiple ways. It could be that for any one of the um, samples that was taken, a piece of biofilm had broken off, which only maybe contained one or a few of these organisms. Another explanation is as the patient cycles through different antibiotics, as I said previously, certain organisms might be killed off or reduced in number by one type of antibiotic, and then other organisms are then allowed to, to grow up and proliferate. And so there's this constant cycling between different antibiotics and different um, organisms. But because of the extreme tolerance of antibiotics uh, to bacteria when they're in biofilms, the infection um, of any one of these organisms may ne never totally be um, cleared. And so they just keep um, uh, cycling around. Now, one thing in, in our case series um, that we uh, found was that in all cases, the only way that the infection was resolved was when the, when the foreign body was completely removed. And so now we've removed that nidus for infection for the, for the biofilm to attach and grow and be protected from uh, antibiotics and host immune system. So let's take a look at the patient history. And I want to use this slide um, to, to, just, to give an example of some of the timelines involved. And so these are uh, 15 patients that have undergone uh, open uh, gastric bypass surgery. So we have 15 patients, and at the very top bar, it shows the median. And so on this graph, we look at each of the patients, and time zero is when the patient first went in for gastric bypass surgery. Now, the indication for the surgery in the first place was uh, that they were morbidly obese and they went in for gastric bypass surgery to lose weight. Where the line is thin, that indicates um, that the, there's no uh, problems um, uh, that the patient is at least presenting to the, uh, to the hospital with. Where the line opens up, this shows the, um, from when the patient 
first presented uh, with an issue. And then as we see that um, thick line progress to the right over time, this is the duration um, of, the, um, of, of the problems with the, um, with the infection. What you can see is that some of these infections manifested very quickly within a few weeks after the initial surgery. In some cases, for example, if we look at patient one at the very bottom, it wasn't for two and a half years until the patient presented with issues. Now, if we look at the, um, the length of some of these bars, uh, if we look at patient four, for example, we see that that infection went on for four years. Now, in all of these cases, the general surgeons um, that, had, uh, that had originally performed gastric bypass surgery had run out of options, and the only treatment was management of these infections. And the various patients were put on cycles of antibiotics, uh, topical antibiotics, IV antibiotics, uh, oral antibiotics. And, and it was only when Dr. Um, Sandeep Kathu collaborated on the project, and he understood that removal of the foreign body would likely remove the biofilm, that we saw resolution of these infections. And so Dr. Kathu took over the cases. We see his surgery was performed where the little, the asterisks are, the little white stars to the right of those thick bars. And these indicate when uh, Dr. Kathu went in and attempted to remove every last piece of, uh, of the foreign body. Now there's a couple of patients, uh, patient um, 12 and patient 14, where we can see there was an intermediate uh, couple of months, and then the patient presented again. When um, Dr. Kathy went back in, he'd found a couple of small pieces of suture, when I say small, a few millimeters of suture, which he had inadvertently missed the first time. These were removed, and to our knowledge, uh, the last time uh, we followed up on these patients, none of the symptoms had come back, so they were all infection-free. So this illustrates a number of points. It illustrates the fact that sometimes um, these infections can take a long time to manifest. It's not clear why this, what, why this is. Were the bacteria there from the very start of the surgery in a quiescent mode? Or, or did they infect the foreign body at a later point through hematogenous spread? It also shows the duration and the complexity of these infections. And finally, it shows the importance of the, uh, the foreign body. Now, of course, these foreign bodies are not put in for, for no reason at all. They're there to perform a function, as um, all foreign bodies are that are put into the body. In, in this case, the meshes and the sutures were put in to uh, provide mechanical support for the abdominal muscles. And so when they were removed, these patients were at much higher risk for herniation. So Dr. Um, Kathu had to perform um, complex surgery where he made um, incisions of, uh, along the walls of the um, abdominum, abdominal walls to actually reduce the, uh, the stresses put on the uh, absorbable sutures that were used to finally um, close these patients. Also, the patients were under special um, um, guidance to uh, avoid um, strenuous activity and uh, re-herniation. So there's an example that I just used with sutures and meshes. I'm going to move on now to another example, uh, which is uh, orthopedics. Now, um, as I have previously touched on, uh, there's no uh, standard clinical microbiology for methods. Uh, these methods that I'm going to be showing in this um, case series are based on microscopy-based research. The methods are highly specialized and time-consuming. These are laboratory methods. They're not easy to standardize. They require very specialized um, training. So there's indirect methods for um, diagnosing uh, biofilms or infection. These can be inflammatory markers. However, these are not necessarily infection specific. And so oftentimes inflammatory markers can be, um, um, can be produced uh, because of trauma or because of the uh, body reaction um, to a foreign body. And uh, one of the other issues is with inflammatory markers, there's no antibiogram. So we don't know what the infecting, if indeed there is an infecting bacteria, we don't know what that bacteria, uh, what that species is. And we also don't have no information on what antibiotics it may be resistant or susceptible to.
DNA and RNA. So next-gen sequencing um, is increasing being, increasingly being used, uh, being explored as a diagnostic. So this is uh, culture independent. However, there are some issues with DNA and RNA. One is contamination. It's difficult to know whether that DNA and RNA actually came from an infecting organism, came from the patient, came from the surgeon, came from the office of the uh, operating room um, environment, or indeed might have been present in the um, surgical fluids. Because, of course, surgical fluids, irrigation fluids, and instruments might be sterile, but they are not necessarily, anti uh, they're not necessarily DNA free. And as I mentioned, with inflammatory markers, there's no anti uh, biogram. Another method which is um, uh, begin, uh, becoming um, increasingly explored is to take specimens and do um, sonication in an attempt to remove biofilm from those materials and also um, do extended culture because it's now known that bacteria when they're in biofilms can, be, can go into a quiescent dormant state where they don't readily grow. The next slides I'm going to be using are going to be primarily based on uh, microscopy. And I'm going to be using um, a case study. It was um, a little older case study back from 2008. It still illustrates the present issues that we're dealing with biofilms. And although we know a lot more uh, about biofilms from uh, research in the labs, it shows that we haven't come a long way in um, clinical diagno diagnosis and treatments in the uh, intervening 12 years. So in the slides I'm going to show you now, these are there's some x-rays and a timeline. This was a painter, uh, a tradesman that fell off a ladder and had some pins uh, put into, it shattered his elbow and had some pins put into the elbow. And you can see in um, panel A the pins in the elbow. Now if we look at the timeline, time, um, time zero is when those pins were first um, put in. And we can see it wasn't until five years until the patient presented with issues. Now, if we look at the, um, the, uh, the text, we follow the arrow uh, from the red bar. This is where the patient um, presented or came into the hospital. And we follow that arrow back. We can see some of the, mic the microbiology findings that were found at that time. So in this case, um, hard, uh, uh, hardware it was decided to remove hardware. It was, it was decided that there was a possibility of infection, uh, but this was based on anecdotal evidence. There was gram um, and culture were negative, there low, was low uh, white blood counts. However, there was some reactive tissue that was seen on inspection. The void was filled with tobramycin and cement. And this patient underwent a, a two, what's known as a two-stage revision. They were put on surveillance and then another, um, a total elbow arthroplasty was performed when it was deemed that there were no bacteria in that joint space. Approximately another year went by and the, the patient presented with, with issues. The, um, the x-rays show signs of lucency, that's um, loosening around the, um, uh, around the joint space. Uh, a debridement was performed, but again, there was gram and culture uh, negative. However, the symptoms um, persisted, and it was decided to remove the total uh, elbow arthroplasty and a tobramycin um, cement spacer and uh, was placed, but this time it was still gram and culture negative. Symptoms um, proceeded, and we can see now we're getting um, this, and, and the spacer was removed. You can see now we're up to about two years since the, uh, the patient first uh, presented with issues, so we've had multiple surgeries. Again, it was gram culture negative, and yet the um, the symptoms um, persisted. And so, in the end, there was some retained um, cement that had been left um, in the um, in the intramedullary canal that was removed. And this is where we came in and we inspected the uh, piece of cement for biofilm, and we used some um, next generation sequencing to look for bacterial RNA and DNA. At this point, the patient was left with a flail arm. Basically, they had no elbow. And so, a long and protracted um, uh, treatment for this, uh, for this patient. So, in this slide at the top left, we see the piece of cement and fragment that came out. This was a few centimeters. 
uh, four, approximately four centimeters in length. And immediately below, we see the confocal microscopy. The cement spacer is blue, and we can see in um, yellow, yellowish green, these are live bacteria attached to that material. On the right side, these are uh, uh, biofilms. We see coxide, they're dividing coxide, they're alive, and these are on the perisprothetic tissue associated with that spacer. When we did um, PCR uh, for DNA and RNA, we, we were uh, positive for Staph aureus. So Staph aureus biofilms were present on that um, spacer. And again, it was only after the foreign body was removed did the infection resolve. So hopefully I've illustrated um, how biofilm infections can be difficult to di diagnose, that oftentimes symptoms can be suggestive of infection, pain, swelling, inflammation, persistent chronic episodes, acute outbreaks. However, they may be culture negative or uh, microbiology might be uh, incomplete, and they might be non or minimally responsive to antibiotics. And so there's a number of cases where um, it has been thought that um, biofilm infection has been mistakenly um, or misdiagnosed as inflammation. And some of the examples there are Titus media, um, um, ear infections capture a contracture associated with breast implants, and also uh, the example that I just showed, um, orthopedic infections. However, in, certain, in, in some cases, bi uh, bacterial biofilms are not always very difficult to, um, uh, to detect. Some of, the, some of the examples where we, where, where we know uh, the microbiology of, for example, the teeth in gingivitis, periodontitis, and also in uh, CF lung infections. And so it, it, it's sort of site-specific and surgical site-specific um, uh, on how difficult the, the difficulty might be in the diagnosis of biofilms. Finally, I'm just going to leave with a slide here to uh, further illustrate the issues. This is a, um, uh, a case um, of a patient that uh, had hydroencephalitis, um, swelling of the brain. Um, they had a drain put in, to, uh, an internal drain, to drain the, um, the inflammatory fluid in, into the gut. And periodically, this patient would present with headaches, which were manifested due to the internal drain blocking. And so um, on the right side is a, um, uh, an image showing um, an external drain, which is put in. This is, a, um, uh, this is an image um, that was taken from, from the web. It was not this particular patient. But it's an example of how an external drain is put in to, to, for surveillance for the presence of uh, bacteria. Inflammation of fluid is collected on a daily basis, it's cultured. If um, no uh, bacteria are cultured after a certain period, it's deemed safe to put in an um, in internal drain. So this patient had an internal drain, um, and when the um, external drain was removed, Dr. Um, er Ernest um, Braxton, who is a uh, neurosurgeon uh, resident, uh, working on this case, he took that drain and and looked at it for the presence of biofilm. And when we look at, when we when we looked inside the lumen, if we look in the top left, we have our confocal images here. The lumen has been cut. Uh, a slice of lumen has been cut out of the drain, and we're looking down um, um, down on it. Uh, the blue dashed line shows the middle of the lumen. Kind of the uh, the wider part is the um, the drain material itself. Then we look, if we look at A2 and A3, this is um, live dead imaging showing that almost half of that drain is occluded with biofilm. And then in panel A4, we see the bright field image and the fluorescent image put together. We, um, we were managed to take some material from the drain in panel C, and we see live bacteria attached to some host, host cells. These are the large red objects are the, are the nuclei of host material. And so even, even though that this surveillance um, based on this drain was considered non-infected, it actually had bacteria biofilm growing in it. So in a recent um, diagnos diagnostic um, from um, Dr. Parvizi's um, group, 
they make some salient points uh, uh, regarding biofilms and chronic PJI. This is it, both in timing and lack of systemic inflammation. Uh, PJI may in fact indicate biofilm associated infection. Most biofilm species escape detection by conventional culture-based methods. And culture-negative infections may be misdiagnosed as a septic loosening and fail to receive the appropriate treatment. Many patients have previously received antibiotic therapy, which may eliminate the planktonic bacteria that are more easily detected by traditional approaches. And so in clinical culture, we might not get the planktonic bacteria because they've been killed by the antibiotics, but the protected bacteria in the biofilm remain hunkered down on the um, foreign body. And thus, there's an urgent need for alternative culture-independent methods of PGI infections. So why do clinical culture methods lack sensitivity? I have a high false, um, rate of false negatives. As I've uh, mentioned throughout, uh, there's a number of explanations, possibly inappropriate sampling. The fluid might not represent the biofilm itself. Biofilms are often on surfaces, but they're very patchy. So it's not always clear whether we're going to collect, whether biofilm will be collected even in a swab. Possibly inappropriate medium and culture conditions. If the biofilm is a slow grower, they might not be um, grown um, for long enough to be able to detect these um, slow growers. Or in, in some cases, such as Staph aureus, mutations can render them um, to become, um, to become um, anaerobic, and thus they might not be grown efficiently unless they're in an anaerobic um, chamber. And also antimicrobial host factors such as nucleases and antimicrobial peptides might prevent the, the growth of bacteria when they're in planktonic form, but yet not be, and so they might not show up in clinical culture, but yet they're not um, powerful enough to kill the biofilms when they're in the body. So in conclusion for this section, uh, biofilms grow on a multitude of uh, materials and devices. Biofilm, bacteria when they're in biofilms are highly tolerant of antibiotics. Often physical debridement is the only solution there's a pressing need for biofilm prevention and treatment, a need for better biofilm diagnostics, and the development of anti-infective materials that do not compromise mechanical function or biocompatibility. So now I'd like to move on to the next um, section of the uh, program. And in this section, I'd like to discuss some of the issues in developing performance standards for anti-biofilm therapeutics. As I mentioned previously, there's no definitive biomarker for biofilm infection, no medical imaging mortality. Bacteria and biofilms are difficult to control and manipulate. Biofilm growth is highly varied and contextual. Biofilm treatments are highly varied and, con uh, and contextual also. And so all of these issues lead to um, complexities when we're thinking about how to develop performance standards for antibiofilm therapeutics. And how do we make performance standards in the lab compatible um, with um, biofilms um, that, we, uh, that surgeons and physicians may encounter clinically? So these are, these are all um, issues that we are going to explore in the next section. So traditionally, uh, bacteria or microbiology, uh, clinical microbiology has been um, based on, the, on um, using planktonic cultures. So these are the broth cultures that we're, uh, many of us will be familiar with from uh, microbiology labs. So grown in test tubes, grown in flasks, they're homogeneous, they can be um, diluted readily, and, the, uh, and um, anyone sample aliquot um, is representative of those, um, of those cultures. So relatively easy to use, we can work with small volumes. We can take a 10 mil or 100 mil flask, and we can go and we can pick out uh, 10 microliters, and we can spot it on a plate, or we can expose it to um, certain um, antibiotics, and that one 10 microliters is going to be pretty much the same as all the other 10 microliters in that volume. However, biofilms are much more difficult. It's much more difficult to standardize the amount of biofilm that's growing on a surface. Biofilms are highly unpredictable, um, highly variable. 
And even if we do standardize the amount of biofilm on a surface, if we have a surface that's one centimeter squared, how do we cut that up into half and half again, half again and half again, and get down to small volumes which are representative without destroying the, um, without affecting some way the biofilm? These are all issues that need to be um, thought about in terms of um, designing standardized methods. In addition, bio, biofilm susceptibility changes over time. So biofilms um, don't just appear and um, stay as they are. Uh, new organisms can come and go. They can produce um, a slime polymer matrix, which protects them. And this can change over time. They can go through cycles where biofilm, uh, where bacteria can escape from the biofilm, and then they can regrow. And so again, so these cycles of growth and, re and um, dispersal and cycles of uh, production of different polymers and uh, also potentially cycles of different organisms residing in the biofilm each present themselves with a different problem because each one of these cases, the biofilm is going to look differently um, according to a standard method at one time than it would at a different time. So what's the relevant challenge concentration? So in the previous, um, uh, the previous part of the program, I sort of discussed how sometimes biofilms are just in small, well, we only see maybe tens, hundreds of bacteria on a surface. Is 100 bacteria um, an, an appropriate concentration for a standard method? And if so, how do we achieve such a small concentration on the surface? What is the relevant challenge time? Clinical microbiology is predicated on a 24 hours or an overnight assay. With biofilms, there are studies which show that it might take weeks or days or weeks to uh, cause significant reductions in uh, the amount of biofilm bacteria. There's mass transfer. There's how do the, this is, uh, the transport of an antibiotic or an antimicrobial. Is the actual agent getting to the bacteria or is the slime matrix protecting that agent from getting, from, from the, um, uh, from getting to the bacteria? And so this also provides a time um, dimension which needs to be taken into consideration. How do we evaluate efficacy? What number of log reduction needs to be made before we decide whether a treatment may have um, clinical uh, relevance or not. And again, and so what is this relevant reduction in bio burden that we see in the lab, and how do we translate this to um, clinical treatment? These are all um, important issues for consideration. So in this slide here's a, um, is a schematic which um, shows a stylized representation of the various stages in uh, biofilm formation. We start off um, at the um, uh, far left, uh, at the nine o'clock position, with um, single cells coming to a surface. So we can imagine brand new surface open in the uh, OR, um, completely sterile, uh, put into a surgical site, um, for example. And if uh, bacteria are in the vicinity from the uh, patient's skin, from the OR environment, then there's a possibility that those bacteria uh, be can become um, uh, attached to that material. Now, when those bacteria are on the surface, um, if they evade um, host immunity, they can uh, start to begin to grow. So now we're going to be going clockwise around the circle, and we can see um, here represented that the bacteria start to grow. Um, in gray, they produce a, um, a kind of grayish pink. They produce a slime matrix. Um, in this particular case, uh, we illustrate uh, multiple species shown by the different color and different shapes of the bacteria. As we progress around the circle, we get to approximately um, five o'clock. We can see um, uh, the bottom, um, bottom right side. We can see um, chunks of bacteria coming off. Um, single cells um, coming off, and then these um, clumps can, um, if, if there's um, other, um, if there's surgical uh, material or prosthetic tissue, 
these clumps can then come off of one piece of biofilm, reattach, and continue to grow. And so I've represented this here in this um, review as a uh, circle, just illustrating the, uh, the cyclic nature of biofilm, i.e. it's not just a uh, linear process, as is often um, depicted. Now, in each one of these cases, um, on the text in the middle of the circle, I've split these up into the various processes, where we have the initial attachment, uh, initial adhesion, so this is um, as the bacteria come to the surface. And the, the, the top is early development with EPS and cell uh, division. And we go through the mature, mature biofilm in C, which is a maturation of the EPS, the extracellular polymeric slime matrix, um, the development of heterogeneity in microenvironments. Micro this can lead to dormancy in the biofilm. It can lead to the harboring of antibiotic tolerant cells, such as persister cells, and allows social interactions between the biofilm. And as I said at the very bottom is late stage dispersal. Now, each of these processes, we might think about a different strategy is required. So for the initial adhesion, we might be thinking about a surface, a surface which prevents attachment, or indeed a surface which has antimicrobial efficacy, so if bacteria do attach, it's able to kill the bacteria. Obviously, prevention of adhesion is uh, the ideal um, um, situation because it also uh, because it, it uh, prevents the uh, the buildup of biofilm. And um, as as we know, the longer biofilm uh, remains, the more antibiotic tolerant it gets. In addition to the surface, we also think about irrigants at this point. As the bacteria attach, they are um, less protected. And so they, more be, they might be more prone to um, antimicrobial agents or uh, in a wash or in, a, uh, or in an irrigant. In terms of treating or preformed biofilms, now we might think about not just an antimicrobial agent, which is effective against the bacteria themselves, but something that might break apart the biofilm. How can we actually disrupt this matrix to cause the biofilm to break apart? This can be physical and also can be chemical, enzymatic. Some bacteria go through a natural dispersal cycle. Are there dispersal agents that we can use? So if the biofilm, so some cells in the biofilm um, disperse and come off, what is it that the biofilm is doing? What is the biofilm producing? And can we actually use this mechanism to turn it, to turn it against the biofilm itself? For example, if you know that the biofilm cells are using a dispersal signal, can we use that to disperse the biofilm, to have the biofilm disperse when we want the biofilm to disperse, not necessarily when the bacterial biofilm wants to disperse? So as I mentioned previously, um, stand, when we think about standardized um, models uh, and methods for testing, not only is the, uh, the stage of the biofilm highly contextual, but also the mechanism of the, uh, of the therapeutic um, is highly contextual. In this slide, we see a, an example of uh, three cases that we, that we can see where a standard method might be very different. So for example, in the, um, on the left in panel A, we see where uh, a surface, we might be looking at a surface which might have antimicrobial um, efficacy, and in this case, a uh, standard method uh, might only be uh, required to assess the interaction of the organisms um, with the surface for uh, a few minutes to a few hours. In the middle, we see uh, a more of a mature biofilm, and this is exploring the use of antimicrobial or sort of agents which can dissolve the, uh, the biofilm matrix. In this case, we would need uh, possibly longer time periods. Uh, we obviously need um, uh, more biofilm, we need a mature biofilm to test our therapeutic on. And then in the third um, example on the, on, on the right, this is the use of a physical uh, removal method. And so if we're going to be using something like a water jet or an air jet or sonication, we have to be able to expose the biofilm on that, on that material to our physical disruption technique. Whether we're, we're directly trying to um, shoot the biofilm from above, or possibly we might have a surface 
which has a, a, which can be vibrated or stretched or pulled to to remove biofilm. And so the standard method, which we would require for each of these scenarios, might look very different in terms of the experimental setup, the time period, and in terms of the way that we grow the biofilm. So the choice of system is um, uh, based on a number of factors. Uh, we need to think about the biofilm growth model, how do you grow the biofilm to begin with, to make the biofilm um, representative uh, and uh, relevant to our um, treatment modality. And then in terms of therapeutic testing, uh, we need to develop the model which should be compatible with our therapeutic testing model. Obviously, considerations are cost, speed, user variability, and this is a very um, important factor. Uh, we need relatively simple methodologies to reduce user variability. So from one lab to the next lab, we have repeatability. Predictive value. How predictive is our model in, in terms of clinical therapy? And is it aligned to substantiate claims, for example, for F or FDA um, approval? If the model has very low variability, it has um, exceedingly good predictive value, but has not yet been validated by the FDA or STM or other regulatory body, then this might present issues going forward. Does it, does it meet regulatory agency benchmarks or considerations in developing a standard method? When we look at biofilms, uh, much like we see with biofilms themselves, there's many, many different sorts of biofilms. There's also many different biofilm in vitro growth systems. These can range from quite simplistic systems, such as having a certain material and putting a material in a, in a flask and then having biofilm grow on it, to some of the more complex systems that we see here, such as flow cells um, or chemostat um, uh, reactor systems, where, bio, where we have nutrients um, continually bathing the bacteria and allowing them to grow. And in these cases, we can control such things as the nutrient um, input, as well as um, shear stress and mechanical forces acting on the biofilm, if indeed that's relevant for us. Such as we are, and um, well, one of these areas that we might be thinking of, for example, is a, a catheter system, where biofilm growing catheters are subject to quite well um, defined shear stresses. So we have uh, different systems. Um, biofilms grown in, um, in vitro can take many different forms. So here's an example. In this slide, this is Pseudomonas originalis, PA01, it's the same strain. And we can see here different pictures, all of the same strain. The biofilm looks very different in each of these images. And these, are, these biofilms have grown up in different people's labs, and it can look very, very different. So which one is appropriate to use? Again, another complexity. If we were to take the same strain and grow it in a flask in each of these labs and grow it up um, uh, to exponential phase or overnight phase for a 24-hour culture, the variability would inevitably be much less. But when they're, when, when they're growing as biofilms, just the growth conditions, the nutrients, the shear stress, the amount of time can make a, a great difference on how the biofilm looks, and not only how the biofilm looks, but how it, how it interacts with antimicrobials. The standard methods must strike a balance, and this balance is between the relevance of a method, and this moves towards more complexity, then we need re reproducibility, and this generally uh, moves us to le less complexibility. And so how to strike this balance. So if we look at uh, the model systems, a trade-off between simplicity and relevance. Um, in this table, we go from um, the top, which is in vitro methods, and we move through down to the bottom, which is in vivo, large animal methods. And here we move from cheap and simple, but not necessarily uh, recapitulating the, uh, the complexity of the infection, down to animal models, which are very, very expensive and have um, low throughput. And so one of the challenges is where in this process do we want to be in terms of developing the, the standard me uh, methods? Um, oftentimes, of course, the, uh, the process is to use the in vitro uh, methods, the uh, cheaper, cheaper simple methods as screens, 
and then move into the um, to the more expensive, complex models. One of the problems is that the, 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 the screens, if the screens are actually weeding out potentially good technologies uh, or promising technologies, we might not necessarily know that. So by the time we get to the animal model, we might have missed some uh, promising therapeutics. So what is the methods toolbox? So I'm using this, this as an example to, um, to discuss some of, the, some of the tools which are being built up for, for the development of standard methods. We need to think about on the left side, um, the claims. Um, are the claims, is it going to be kill, kill and removal, removal prevention? And then we need to think about setting up the standard method and what outputs are relevant to validate these claims. What microorganisms are we going to use? And what are the growth systems going to be? And how are, and how are we going to do our analysis? Viable count is often used. That's what I would call the gold standard. But then there are supplemental methods such as microscopy, total count from microscopy, uh, bacteria images. So these, these are all considerations in um, developing and uh, standard methods and deciding which of the appropriate standard methods to be used. There are various models existing already, and in this slide, um, it gives you some examples of models which have been um, developed by uh, for AS or sorry ATSM uh, methods, standard methods. These are being um, incorporated the use of a CDC reactor, so Centers for Disease Control reactor. And some of these guidelines are being um, adopted by the uh, FDA as guidelines for uh, validation of a particular um, therapeutic um, in terms of thinking about um, drug or device development uh, process. And so as time goes by, we, uh, these methods are going to uh, continue um, um, to be developed. I'm not going to go through each of these methods, but I just wanted you to be aware, to be able to see these slides, and to be aware that some of these methods um, exist and um, are, are uh, still um, in development. As we move into the more sophisticated in vitro systems required for biofilm, again, we see the considerations are how do you grow the biofilm, what are me mechanisms for treating the biofilm, how do we sample the biofilm? How do we get the bacteria off of the surface or look at the bacteria directly to know whether we've um, killed uh, the bacteria or not? For example, if we get a plate count of zero, is that just because we couldn't get the bacteria off the surface or if indeed we killed all the bacteria? So we need to validate our removal um, methodology as well. And then analysis. Oftentimes we need to look at the surface itself uh, directly as well as um, analyzing a uh, biofilm that might have been removed from that surface. Just going to run quickly now through some slides, just kind of giving you an illustration of some of the various models. Uh, here's an in vitro model. This is a model that's grown um, on a pipette tip. And then the biofilm, this is um, on, on the left slide here, this is a biofilm, which is a multi-species -bio, uh, multi biofilm that forms this film, which is quite uh, fibrous and can actually be physically removed from the, from the, for the, from the pipette tip to, um, uh, to be exposed to different antimicrobial agents. And in this particular experiment, um, which is referenced in the bottom, we can see the comparison of the biofilm that grew on the pipette tip in vitro with the image on the right, which is a biopsy of a, a piece of a wound um, uh, material. And in terms of appearance and in terms of microbiology, the, uh, two, the in vitro biofilm and the ex vivo biofilm look quite similar. These are some other in vitro methods which are uh, commonly used. There's a colony biofilm, which the uh, biofilm is grown on a filter paper, which is placed on the petri plate. The advantage of this over just growing a colony on a, on a petri plate itself is that the filter can be removed and, and then uh, from the petri plate and then put on, say, agar containing new fresh media if we want to replenish the media source, or it can be picked up and then exposed to uh, an antimicrobial surface um, or have an antimicrobial agent added from the top. Drip flow reactor is another reactor in which there's an ASTM or ATSM um, standard uh, method. 
and in this case, nutrients are dripped onto the surface and allowed to gently flow over the surface. And so this is a wetted surface, and this might be more appropriate, say, um, uh, for example, for a tooth surface, which is never completely submerged, but is bathed in a film of fluid. Moving up through the complexity, certain ex vivo models um, are being developed for wounds, whereby um, pig skin is being um, infected with bacteria, uh, bacteria being grown on pig skin or punches from the pig skin, and then exposed to certain antimicrobial agents. Now, in this case, we um, re recut, or these methods uh, recapitulate the, um, the physical um, aspects of the skin, but there's no long-term um, uh, host response with these materials. And so um, they do not fully uh, re recapitulate the, uh, the host response, but it starts to move in the direction from in vitro into these ex vivo um, models and increasing complexity. And finally, uh, we get into small animal models there's a number of uh, murine models which have been developed for uh, wounds. These tend to be um, incisional wounds um, and also uh, orthopedic um, infections have been used in uh, murine and um, rodent, uh, various rodent models. A method which is being increasingly used is that of live animal imaging where uh, bacteria have been isolated and they have been genetically modified to produce light. And so when they've been infected into an, into an animal, in this case we see a, um, a K-wire which has been inserted into the femur of a mouse, and it's been infected with um, staph, a bioluminous and staph aureus, and we can see the surgery on the left. When we look at the right, we can use a technique called um, in vivo um, imaging, we can see that these, uh, this is done on live animals, and we can see the blue and the red show high levels of biofilm or bacterial activity, and we can see them associated with the pin. And this can be used to, to look at the control and this compared to, say, a, uh, a treatment. And then in some cases, in the, like, uh, such as in this case, um, uh, a fluorescent stain can be used in this case um, for, to stain the neutrophils, so here we can see the neutrophil response um, to, that, to the bacteria, um, all in a live animal. So these are now much more sophisticated uh, models that we're moving into. And finally, the large animal model, the pig, is being increasingly used for, um, for burn wound um, biofilms and looking at um, various treatments to prevent or treat um, biofilms um, particularly in the context of wound infections. In terms of our uh, in vivo, ex vivo evaluation, as I mentioned, uh, we've, we've, we've um, developed the biofilm, uh, we've exposed it to a certain treatment, a uh, certain therapeutic, a certain material, and then there's a number, number of different uh, methodologies that we can use to evaluate. These include plate counts, um, it, which is um, quantitative, However, there's sampling and qualtering issues, but also uh, imaging is often used as being the definitive validation technique for actually looking at that surface. This is oftentimes semi-quantitative, as I mentioned in the very first uh, part of uh, the program. The biofilms are often patchy, and as they are often patchy in, uh, clinically, they can often be patchy in our models. And so when we look at surfaces, we might have to look at a number of different locations to be able to sample um, appropriately. Uh, Confocal allows live cell imaging, but scanning electron microscopy allows multiscalar, so it's very easy to, to zoom in and out for a sample, allowing, uh, allowing us to cover much larger areas. We can look at the immune response, we can look at the cytokine profiling um, to the infection, much like the immune response is used as a diagnostic clinically. And we can also look uh, in terms of um, in vivo models as um, criteria, uh, performance criteria, such as closure rate and healing. And so we can look at clinical um, indicators that the infection has been resolved. So in conclusion from this section of the, um, of the program, there are many different biofilm growth systems, and 
the, re the, the take home message here is the reason there are many different biofilm growth systems is because biofilms are extremely complex. They take on many different forms. Um, they change over time, and the therapeutics are highly contextual. And the uh, growth system and exposure system need to be um, appropriate. The validation of a technology is a multi-step process. How do we validate our um, removal process, for example, to know that we've actually removed all the bacteria or any bacteria from a surface when we're trying to evaluate a particular treatment on killing or removing um, that bacteria. How relevant is the model to the type of infection? And again, as I've mentioned, the balance, standard methods versus uh, research relevant methods. And ultimately, large animal models are required until in vitro methods can be shown to recapitulate the in vivo conditions. So that includes my part of the program. And for the next part of the program, which is a uh, the clinical um, portion, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Thorsten Seiler. Thank you, Paul. Um, we're going to spend the next hour talking about the need for definitive anti-biofilm treatment and what is available for this and the reasoning behind this. Um, I'm going to quickly go over some um, outline for this this presentation. So we uh, reiterate a little bit of the stuff that Paul mentioned, the introduction to biofilms, the challenges with diagnosing hypothetic joint infections in a setting of an existing biofilm, current treatment challenges with biofilm, in introduce some of the new technologies to prevent and disrupt biofilms, and new technologies to treat existing biofilms. So in essence, biofilms are um, complex, well-structured communities of microorganisms. They are encased in a self-produced extracellular matrix of uh, polymeric substances. Uh, biofilm matrix consists of polysaccharides, proteins, and extracellular microbiomal DNA. Uh, biofilms can be monomicrobial, or they can be polymicrobial. And once bacteria sit in a biofilm, they exhibit an altered phenotype that enhances the survival of the bacteria. One of the challenges that we face clinically is um, there are three main factors that make it really hard. Well, one is the biomechan uh, biochemical factors. It's the polysaccharides, the antibiotic degrading enzymes that live in the, in the biofilm, the extracellular DNA, efflux pumps, and the quorum sends them the way the bacteria uh, communicate with each other. Then a second column of this would be the molecular mechanism, lateral and horizontal gene transfer that leads to uh, resistance and the mutation over time. And then the altered host factors, right? Um, the regular MIG uh, for antibiotics does not apply in a biofilm. They are more resistant to regular concentrations, oxidative stress, SOS response, chemical signals, toxin, antitoxin molecules, nutrients, temperature, pH changes in a biofilm, the cell density, and the osmolarity. So biofilm, the clinical fact, and that's what we're dealing with, is cleansing or scrubbing does really not remove biofilm. Regular swab cultures only ident identify free-floating bacteria, but not really the bacteria that sit in a biofilm. And then fragmenting biofilm stimulates rapid regrowth, and that, that's some of the facts that people often underestimate. So the treatment can actually lead to rebound that is faster than that. So products that pro uh, produce a breakdown in the biofilm but not complete removal can actually lead to a rebound um, infection. And then finally, the treatment is really not considered the gold standard in isolation anymore. It has to be um, combined with other modalities. And it allows for a time-dependent window for biofilm treatment. So if you look at biofilms in general in the body, they're typically connected to resistant diseases. So you know host factors, acne, chronic otitis media, chronic sinusitis, endocarditis, lung infections, in particular in patients with cystic fibrosis, kidney stones, urinary tract infections, vaginosis, osteomyelitis, those are often associated with biofilm formation. But more recent, uh, more importantly, is 
the device-related infection. For me as an orthopedic surgeon, obviously, orthopedic implants offer the perfect treating ground for biofilm-associated infections. This, this is a case report I really like to show, and that, that's one of the uh, research that Paul participated in. It's just a case report that shows a chronic parapathetic joint infection of an elbow osteoplasty in the confocal and it shows the viable bacteria on the surface of that implant that leads to ultimately the failure of this. So what is the role of infection in joint osteoplasty? If you look at this infection in revision joint osteoplasty are considered one of the top three reasons for failure. So it's for us uh, extremely important field to research in and to find a solution to because the complications associated with an infection in a setting of a revision joint osteoplasty are devastating. So if you look at the aseptic loosening, it's by far the common reason. Instability, wear, and then infection. So it's, it's a top three, right? And if you look at the survivorship of these, it makes it even more important. Now, associated with these revision surgeries and infection comes an increased societal cost. And if you look at this, prosthetic joint infection in general occur between 0.5 and 2.2% of primary osteoplasty, not revision. They are associated with poor outcomes, prolonged hospitalization, uh, loss of workforce, in 2012, they cost about a billion dollars to the healthcare system. In 2020, the estimates are that we exceed about 1.6 billion in healthcare dollars to infections. And if you look at the mortality associated with a parapathetic joint infection, the mortality is 25% at two years, as high as 45% at five years. And if you extrapolate that to some of the common cancers that we see, we will place parapathetic joint infection right up there with some of the most commonly encountered cancers, right? So what are the difficulties associated with biofilm and parapathetic joint infection? Without doubt, it's going to be the difficulty to diagnose and detect these biofilms, right? The ability to, to apply a test that gives you an instant feedback and say, hey, this, this joint is infected that has a biofilm. Well, I can say with confidence there is not a single test available today that would identify a biofilm uh, infection. There is a number of tests, blood work, cultures that will help you in diagnosing this, but there's not a single test that, that can diagnose this. And if you look at this, about 20% of the cases with parapathetic joint infections were unable to identify bacteria. So that can lead to missed or late diagnosis. It can potentially make the outcome even worse. So common things that we use is obviously is a joint aspiration, get some fluid and detect this. If you look at preoperative joint aspirates, the sensitivity, if you pull the analysis from the literature, it's fairly poor. It's only 72%, but the specificity pulled of 95. So ruling it out is even is better. If you look at intraoperative pay implant tissue, which is considered the gold standard, the sensitivity is not much better. It's around 70%. Specificity is a little bit higher at 97%. So overall, these numbers are not great and really highlight the challenges associated with biofilm infections. More recently, there have been reports that really emphasize the use of sonication to disrupt biofilm and then do a diagnostic workup. So this is Andre Trumbo's paper that he uh, worked on when he was at Mayo Clinic and the fellowship is now the, the chair of infectious disease in Berlin. And it was a groundbreaking study when he published this, when he used sonication on explanted implants to dislodge biofilm and then culture the results. When he did this, he got much better results in identifying bacteria that caused the infection. There's more literature around this. Brian Clad out of Pittsburgh looked at this too. And if you look at what we consider the gold standard, the tissue culture from cases, the sensitivity in that series is around 71%. That's what we reported before. If you look at the fluid culture, it's around 59%, which is a little bit lower than the average reported in the literature. But then if you look at the analysis of the culture from sonicated fluid, the sensitivity goes up to 94%. So sonication of explanted implants 
seems to be a beneficial tool to increase the sensitivity of our culture results and the ability to diagnose these infections. Now, more, more studies around the sonication to disrupt biofilm, if you look at this, the re overall reported sensitivities range anywhere between low 70s to the high 80s, up to, in some reports, to 99%. So you definitely see an increase in your sensitivity applying that modality. But the modal uh, modality of using sonication comes at a price, if you look at this, right? There are limitations. You need the specific equipment in the lab. You need the tools. You need the, the workforce. And there's a risk of contamination from taking the explanted implants to your laboratory, sonicate it, and then culture it. And also, the size of an explanted prosthesis sometimes can be a limitation in itself. Also, the, the water bath within the sonicator can be a source of contamination in itself. Now, what are the other tools that could help us with the biofilm? Well, chemical disruption. Rather than using sonication for this, you can do a chemical disruption by using DTT, which is dithiothreatol, uh, right? That's a strong reducing agent that can break down disulfate linkages in the biofilm, right? So if you look at the initial studies that were published in 2012, they showed very similar results in recovery of bacterial loads to the results we saw with sonication, right? And so something that is very promising and you don't need specialized equipment for this. If you look at these studies, looking at this, DPT sensitivity is 85%. It's about 15% higher what we see in normal culture with a specificity that sits around what we know from traditional tests. So both CTT and sonication outperform what we considered our gold standard in the past to detect these infections. Now, more studies of this with a side-by-side -side comparison of disruption via sonication or DTT, if you look at this, the sensitivity for sonication, DTT, 89 and 91%, those are numbers that we were not able to achieve for regular tissue culture. Second study, again, looking at DTT, EDTA, EDTA as uh, chemical disruption and sonication. In that study, actually, the sonication outperformed the chemical disruption. So um, there's still some truth to using sonication for this. Now, Use of intraoperative dye to quantify the, the biofilm. This is something that I routinely use. I think this is a very uh, neat technique, very simple, very inexpensive. You inject sterile methylene blue into the joint prior to the explantation. Methylene blue will bind and stain bacteria within the tissues, and you can do targeted degradement. So it's very cost effective, very simple. Um, an easy technique. This was published originally by Matt Abdel from the Mayo Clinic, and there's since then more reports that came out of this. So if you look at this study, targeted debridement, Eric Hansen out of UCSF, uh, the pictures on the right, um, my pictures from an intraoperative case. Uh, on top you see the syringes, the loaded with the methylene flu, I inject this, then I open the knee joint, and I have the stained tissue. Now the downside to this is you really have to dilute the methylene blue, otherwise all the tissue is going to be stained. So you don't have the effect of quantifying the biofilm and then doing a targeted degradement. Now, what else is available at this point or novel to diagnose these uh, devastating infections? Well, biosensor technology is something that, that has been recently recognized as a uh, viable option to, to identify these infections. And, the way this works is the biorecognition usually is an element is identified and it interacts with an analyst. The signal is then converted into an ele electronic signal through a transducer and then shows this. And the biorecognition element with biosensors could be anything that you want to target. It could be enzymes, antibodies, microorganisms, tissues, extracellular DNA or RNA that can all be targeted with that technique. One example for this is, which has shown some promising 
initial results is CLOBAC, which is a rapid bacterial detection system, which is specific for bacterial ATP. So this, this seems to be cost effective, um, can be rapidly, sensi uh, rapidly um, applied to detect the bacteria. Um, yeah. But the initial trials are still underway and there's no results available at this point. This, this is a promising technique that we use in, in our hospital as matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spec. So essentially what that does, it enhances your current technique. So you take tissue or fluids, you culture it on place, and then you have a technician look at it, identify it, uh, you culture and sensitivities. Currently that technique cannot be applied on samples that you get from the operating room right away. So you still have to culture this on the agar plates, but your time to identify identification of the bacteria is much faster if you look at this. Rather than growing it for a longer period of time, you need a smaller amount to do mass back and you can accurately identify these bacteria. So that's a very promising technique that has definitely changed how we looked at this at this point. Rapid antibody-based diagnosis, that has been around for, for a while, so it's ELISA. Uh, Cost-effective, um, it has been used for synovial fluids in humans, in paraprostate joint infections, and the sensitivity has been outstanding at 91% and the specificity of 100% with that ELISA technique. Something that is still in the infant stages, but it is in the development pipeline. Next is the film array pod culture ID, or the what we call the Biofire Film Array that has been developed in conjunction with some of the Mayo Clinic guys, Robin Patel. Uh, what it does, it focuses, is a multiplex PCR and focuses on the diagnosis of sonicate fluid for, for paraprosthetic joint infection. The benefits include the hands-on time and the really short two-hour turnaround time to do this, excellent specificity, and poor sensitivity, and one of the downsides is it's specific to the pathogens that are part of that assay. Something that is um, or was released last year that uh, I think has shown some, some promise that I would like to use clinically too is uh, fluorescence imaging. Moleculite is a FDA proof device that digitally measures wound areas and detects the location of high bacterial loads. For me, this is, this is an interesting tool because it guides my, my surgical debridement, right? So if you look at these images, it clearly shows where the red and the cyan colors, colors are that the bacterial loads are the highest. So with the targeted debridement, you should be able to reduce the bacterial burden in the wound. Let's talk a little bit, shift gears, and talk a little bit about the role of antibiotics and biofilm prevention, right? Most of us give antibiotics preoperatively, which is the gold standard prior to surgery. This is something that has been proven over and over. And it's based on actually a study that was published in the 1970s looking at a randomized controlled trial of patients with arthroplasty or spine fusions. If you look at infection rate, they were significantly reduced when patients received the dose of penicillin prior to surgery. So this is essentially the, the trial that, that showed us that we should get preoperative antibiotics. And this has become the gold standard. Well, it, there is or there are other ways to deliver antibiotics to prevent biofilm um, formation. And this, this is a very con contentious topic because there's a debate between the U.S. and Europe, whereas in Europe, people are favoring using antibiotics in the cement to lower the risk of biofilm formation and uh, lower the risk of septic failure. Versus in the U.S., the routine use of antibiotics in cement and arthroplasty really hasn't shown to be very beneficial, right? There are no differences in infection rates among patients that received antibiotic cement versus patients that did not receive. So that, that is something that is inconclusive at this point. I think that although the data out of Europe is, is very strong, we could not replicate this in the U.S. Now, if you talk about antibiotic treatment, no matter how you deliver it, if you deliver it IV, if you deliver it via bone cement or degradable, not all antibiotics can penetrate biofilm. 
they have well penetrating antibiotics and they have poor penetrating antibiotics and probably the one that we use most commonly are the ones that are not good penetrators of biofilm. Vancomycin, which is a glycopeptide, aminoflucoside, right? gentamicin, cephalosporins are not good penetrators versus levampin is a really good one. Uh, Cipro is a really good one that can uh, tetracycline is a really good one that penetrates. Daptomycin is an excellent biofilm penetrator. Clindamycin. Um, it's really important to know who are the antibiotics or which are the antibiotics that can be used to treat or that we know for sure can penetrate biofilm infection versus not. So if you look at the antibiotic treatment of biofilm, well, I said before that it, well, the good penetrators and the poor penetrators, septomycin, monocyclin, Tricyclin are more effective for MRSA versus vancomycin, which is a really poor biofilm penetrator. Now, if you combine this, you see in the next slide is if you combine the antibiotic treatment of biofilm, if you take rivampin, uh, vancomycin or, or daptomycin, it becomes way more effective because uh, rivampin is an antibiotic that can really well penetrate this biofilm. If you look at that right lower picture, if you look at this in osteomyelitis, if you look to the far right, that's vancomycin and rivampin as a combination versus normal saline on the far left as your control, you see the combination product where you add rivampin to your regimen, you get much better results. So if you decide to treat an implant-related infection and retain the implant, you probably, if you have an option, should combine antibiotics to get a better result. Now, let's go to the main, main stream of treatment options, which is surgical treatment of biofilm. So, which is best? I think the scope of this lecture is not broad enough to cover all of this, but we should go over the different options available. Um, so there's the treatment, antibiotics, and implant retention, single-stage revision. You take the implant out, put a new one in. Two-stage, you remove the implant, put an antibiotic spacer in, and come back at a later point. Amputation, obviously, you get rid of the infected limb. Or conservative treatment with antibiotics. And I think from the slides before, it covers this really well that antibiotics isn't really uh, a viable treatment option, but it may become a treatment option for patients they are not surgical candidates. But what is what is the treatment going to look like when you fail any of this? Are you going to do a repeat washout there? Are you going to do repeat two states? Are you going to do resection arthroplasty, leave that joint without an implant? Are you going to fuse it or are you going to amputate it? There are several options that we need to think about it when we approach patients about this. So if you look at this in detail, so again, the surgical treatment there is an option, especially in an acute infection with unstable implant, good soft tissue, um, uh, good soft tissue, and a bacteria that is really susceptible to IV antibiotics. One stage again, you require healthy soft tissue envelope. You need a microorganism or bacteria that is susceptible to antibiotics, and you should have a healthy host to be successful there. Two stage still remains the gold standard in the U.S. There may be a shift. There's a, a big prospective randomized trial underway that shows no difference between one stage and two stage. But until the results are published from this, the two stage remains to be the gold standard in the U.S. Uh, where the explantation is followed with an antibiotic spacer, IV antibiotics, and then you return to, uh, to the operating room for re-implantation. Explant or fusion. Those are typically options for severely immunocompromised patients. They're bedridden. They may have some uh, soft tissue issues, IV truck abusers, right? And then long-term suppression. Those those are the options where you just keep the infection at check. This is typically for patients where surgery is not indicated, they're immobile, or they refuse the procedure. So that may become an option in, in, in those patients. Now, biofilms make treatment difficult, for sure. If you look at the two-stage procedure, which, as I mentioned before, is the gold standard in the U.S., the infected implants are removed, an antibiotic spacer is placed, 
with eventual reimplantation. But if you look at this, with this approach, you can cure about 85% of the infection. So that's pretty good if you look at this overall. And this is a meta-analysis looking at one stage versus two stage, right? Now, if you look at this in, in detail, at that first stage, when you remove the implant, you place an antibiotic spacer. It's a misconception that that spacer is going to treat the infection. It's actually the IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics that treat the infection. The cement that gets delivered with the antibiotic only reaches therapeutic levels for about 24 to 48 hours, right? It's a slow release. After that period of time, that spacer actually serves as a potential surface for new or recurrent biofilm formation. And it's very common that biofilms can form on PMMA, so bone cement. So this is not something that is uncommon. And what's going on with the failed two stage, right? If you look at this, and these are numbers that you should disclose to a patient if a two stage fails you see about a 20%, at least 20% drop in success rates with repeat two stages, right? A DARE and IND procedure after a two stage typically does not solve the issue, right? So it should be treated with another two stage and the results drop from 85% to anywhere between 40% and 60% at that point. If you look at DARE specifically, we know that there are reports that show increased failure rates that failed there. As I mentioned before, the indications for there are very narrow. It needs to be good host, it needs to be an early acute infection. A DARE procedure is not an, a procedure that should be attempted in a patient with positive blood culture because of the high systemic bacterial burden that will fail. Right. So IND, you should be aware of this, can increase the failure rate in patients with acute hematogenous infections. So if you look at the treatment antibiotics and implant retention, the DARE success rate to begin with, even in a, in a selective patient population, does not reach the success rate of a two-stage revision. Typically, the results with the DARE are anywhere between 60 and 75%. So you're about 15 to 20% lower in terms of success that you are with a two-stage approach. Okay, now going over the diagnostic and treatment options, clearly there is a need for new antibiofilm technology. If you look at this, and I talked to that before, when bacteria enter a biofilm stage, the eradication is a lot more difficult. In general, the mix the concentration of the antibiotic needs to be up to a thousand times more than planktonic bacteria. The reported rates of failure for DARE, 40%, two-stage revision, 20 to 30% are, are pretty daunting numbers. So you've got to come up with some type of solution that you can use before getting these implants infected. Now, so what are the next steps to do this? Well, biofilm prevention and eradi eradication at an early stage. Those are the key interventions that we need to work on to treat these infections. And how can we do this? Well, we will touch on some of the relevant technologies in both prevention and treatment in the second half of this le lecture. And if you look at this, there is uh, different point of attack. One would be to prevent the adhesion of bacteria to implants that can be done reversible or irreversible. You change how bacteria communicate, meaning you interfere with uh, uh, quorum sensing. You can address the dispersal of these and render them more susceptible to antibiotic treatment so they get dispersed from the biofilm in two point tonic stage. Or you address killing persister cells that sit inactivated in a biofilm. Or you treat them with bacteriophages. There are 
several new techniques that are promising. Let's start with some of these. The first one is surface modification of implants. And those are broadly categorized in three categories. Passive surface finishing prevents the bacterial adhesion, right? The examples would be hydrophilic surface, right? Anti-adhesive polymers, hydrogels. There's active surface finishing, which means it contains some type of pharmacologically active agent substance that is going to fight that infection. That can be a silver ion. It could be nanoparticle. It could be antimicrobial peptides. It could be antibiotics. And then there's the pay-operative antibacterial local carrier or coating, right? Those are your hydrogels. Those are your antibiotic-loaded PMMA, your antibiotic-loaded bone grafts, your antibiotic-loaded calcium sulfates, beads, and whatever is available there. Let's talk about the surface modification, because I think there's some interesting technology available around this. If a treat, um, there is, most of the implants are made out of titanium. And UV uh, light treatment actually degrees the bacterial adhesion without affecting the osteointegration of implants. Something that's fairly new has been studied over this. And if you look at some of the polymer coatings, on titanium implants. They also have shown to reduce the bacterial adhesion. And those studies have been already in preclinical stages. So hydrophilic poly um, acids, polyethylene oxide, protein resistant polyethylene glycol. So implant coatings has shown some really promising results, right? Most promising is probably the passive surface modification to make it a hydrophobic or super hydrophobic surface treatment, right? Those interfere with the bacterial adhesion. So if you look at this, you can also coat titanium implants. And Albumin has shown some results in an animal experiment. You can do biosurfactants. You can change the surface to a hydrophilic nature, or you apply a hydrogelic calcium sulfate to reduce this. So passive surface modification of implants has several modalities that have shown some promising results. None of these, however, have made it to clinical stage at this point. Now, one of the other things that, that has shown some promising is nanopattern, which essentially modifies the implant surface. As a surgeon, that makes me nervous. The implant surface is there that I get osteointegration. I don't want anybody to manipulate my surface and potentially impact the osteointegration, right? But there has been several studies that have shown that nanopattering and the fabrication of these pores actually have shown decreased biofilm formation on implants. In addition, these studies really have shown that creating a nanostructure can delay biofilm formation to up to a week, with about 50% of the initial bacteria killed at the time of adhesion. Now, again, the studies have not really evaluated the ingrowth. Now, let's move on to a surface modification in an active manner. The mechanism of releasing substances, such as silver coating, this is a modality that actually has been in clinical stages. And the silver coating mechanism relies on silver cations that interfere with cell membrane permeability, cell metabolism, and the formation of reactive oxidant uh, species that kill bacteria. So if you look at this, silver coating has been used in tumor implants. Tumor patients are some of our most vulnerable patient population and are more susceptible to obtaining or creating an infection. And silver-coated prosthesis, especially in high-risk patients that still have to undergo chemo or radiation after surgery, has almost decreased the risk of infection by using that technology. And this has been shown in several studies. 
right? If you look at this, overall in the pooled analysis, if you look at this, post-op infection rate and silver-coated implants were about 12% versus 22% in a control group. So these are pretty promising results, right? Adults, again, tumor implants, high-risk patient population. If you look at surface modification, again, active matter, there are other metals that we can use, hydrogen, chlorine, selenium, zinc, copper, titanium dioxide. There's multiple ones. There's an iodine clinical study with 47 patients treated with iodine-supported titanium implants. At a 30-month follow-up in these patients, none of the, uh, none of the patients that received an iodine-supported titanium implant had a developed an infection. So there's some truth to maybe there are more options available in an active surface modification matter to treat these infections or prevent the formation of biofilms. Now, again, if you look at this, this is looking at nanolayering, implant coding, something that I'm very cautious about um, using because, again, you are coding a surface that is made for osteointegration that could potentially lead to problems down the road. If you look at these typically polymer coatings that have antibiotics in it or have antimicrobial peptides that can prevent the adhesion and then the growth of bacteria on implants. Using this service, active service modi modification in that way, what it does, it typically only can deal with it for a short period of time. You're talking about hours, not days. This is an interesting technology again. It, it, it has been shown over and over that it is very effective especially in an animal model. It has not made it to the clinical stage, but if you look at this, it's a smart coding. It's an implant coding that uh, allows for controlled release of vancomycin or other antibiotics, and that is an option where you code it where the implant releases it over time and then it goes away and would allow for delayed or in growth at this point. And it's an interesting technology that hopefully is going to get explored some more in the in the near future. We talked about the antimicrobial peptides, so they, they're part of innate immunity. They're an interesting alternative to conventional antibiotics. The advantages, they're less susceptible to resistance, right? And they can target, ideally, multiple bacterial processes, right? Not just one, versus an antibiotic typically targets one, vancomycin, the disruption of cell walls, right? These can potentially target more than one mechanism. Now, if you look at this, there are multiple candidates available. If you look at these antimicrobial peptides, they are still at the preclinical stage. And if you combine them with antibiotics, they really show promising results. So that would be an active modification, I think, that may have a promising application in the future. Now, Finally, we talk about the local carriers or coding. We don't have to talk much about PMMA, the bone cement, the mixing antibiotics in it or antibiotic beads. Let's focus on some of the newer technologies, the hydrogels um, that can be used to coat um, the implants that are used, right? The fibrin gels and other gels, and they have shown some promising results. Again, not a long-term solution. The release of antibiotics with these local carriers is, is held to a short period of time, um, but it's an interesting solution, especially in high-risk patients. Summarizing this, surface modification, I think, has some promising modalities available for us. However, the concerns are about the interference with osteointegration incomplete implant coding. We don't know anything about long-term toxicity of these delivery agents, regulatory issues that we know that from smart implants that may be an issue. And there's really no or very minimal clinical studies available to date. Um, the availability of these products is limited and they come at a high price.
Now, moving on to some of the other things, disaggregating agents. We can degrade extracellular matrix, which leads to the dispersion of bacteria and then hopefully easier targeting with the antibiotics that we use in a regular setting. So it reduces the number of cells within the biofilm and the biofilm mass in itself. Some of these technologies have been around for a while, if you look at this. Um, the common DNA ACE exhibits really potent anti-biofilm, antimicrobial sensitive uh, activities. Um, it has been tested against a variety of bacteria and has shown really to be effective in detaching established biofilm while at the same time increasing the sensitivity to IV antibiotics. So I think this is this is a viable option as well. Right. Again, if you look at this, interesting results with this has been shown to be effective. And this is again one of the papers that uh, Paul and his wife worked on. Um, it really looks at the mechanism of action of DNAs and really found that it breaks down the eDNA, which is a major component of the extracellular protein matrix and biofilm, and at the same time increases or enhances the efficacy of the antibiotic. Now, when you look at these agents as a group, there are multiple agents available. Probably the most researched one is the, is the A to the recombinant DNA or dispersion B. 14HK, right? There's lots of literature, papers, research papers around this, and then has not quite made it into the clinical stage. And the question is also the impact of these modalities with really well established biofilm. There are some concerns about really established biofilm and an established extracellular matrix that it may produce enough proteolytic activity to break down these enzymes that potentially could break down the biofilm. So there is a mechanism, a defense mechanism of the biofilm against these uh, agents. Now looking at some more experimental stuff that is coming down the pipeline is the, the soft robotic concepts and, and catheter design, which is like an on-demand fouling release. So essentially, this is one of the studies that came out of my home institution that's looking at uh, urine Foley catheters, uh, that they have regioselective actuation of the elastomere, so bacteria attached to it. They debond the biosome on the inner surface, and then the actual urine flushes out the bacteria, um, preventing the adhesion or formation of a mature biofilm. So biofilm eradication via a quorum sensum. Um, again, what we talked before, this has created some interest in the early 2000s where people thought that by inhibiting the way bacteria within a biofilm communicate could help treat these biofilms. That technology we never made it into a clinical stage. While it was promising in a laboratory setting, it has not held truth in a, in a clini clinical setting with this. Um, other options, non-antibiotic biofilm targets, right? So if you look at a fatty acid, this to deconic acid um, has shown some uh, interesting results in inhibiting staph aureus growth and biofilm formation in in vitro. Um, again, that technology, by promising in a laboratory setting, has not made it into a clinical setting or animal studies. This is this is another option is the development of vaccines. This is some of the early work of uh, Mark Shirtliff, who unfortunately passed away, I think, last year. 
unexpectedly you know, as a collaborator, Paul Shutley, uh, worked on uh, a vaccine against MRSA in an osteomyelitis model. And if you look at this, uh, in a control setting, um, rabbits that didn't get the vaccine, only 33% cleared the infection versus if you had a vaccine and you got treated with IV antibiotics, about 88% of these rabbits cleared the infection. That's certainly um, a promising approach, although there have been attempts in the past, um, and there was one attempt by one of the larger companies to clear this with the FDA and that their vaccine did uh, did not clear the FDA. There was a large clinical trial in uh, spinal surgery, and it, it did not uh, show the results or didn't replicate the results that were seen in an animal experiment. Now, another newer technique is the electrical stimulation, where you apply cathodic voltage-controlled electrical stimulation to it. Um, it changes the electrochemical properties of an implant, and it can disrupt um, bacterial adhesion and the elimination uh, during the biofilm formation process. So this is something that's really interesting. There are some concerns around this uh, with electric stimulation, especially with an implant. There are concerns over corrosion that can be caused for this. But if you look at the results here, uh, has been shown by, by several groups. There are some interesting results with titanium implants that were infected. That really the combination of antibiotics and electrical stimulation um, decreased uh, biofilm formation in these models. Now, this is another new technology is CBT, which is photosensitive dye that UV treatment is going to treat the biofilm. This is something that the photodynamic therapy that, that has been around for a while, perhaps not as commonly used in, in our field, it has been more frequently used in patients uh, or by dentists in general. Okay, now photodynamic therapy, we talked about this, it showed high uh, efficacy in killing MSSA, this more common in the dental area. Going through this, some novel antibiotics. Next, there are some really new targets that are promising. Yeah, some of these have been approved in 2014 for skin and skin structure infections with a topical biofilm. They have shown some really promising results. Retavacin uh, is one of them, right? Uh, especially in combination with uh, with Ampen has shown really, really promising results. Unfortunately, they have not been cleared for the treatment of periprosthetic infections. They have been used in clinical trials, right? There are several candidate trucks with new antibiotics available to go through this. Most of these uh, were approved uh, around 2014-15, right? You can change the delivery of antibiotics to be more effective. You can use nanoparticles. You can use uh, liposomes. You can do uh, structures that can penetrate the biofilm to deliver the antibiotic inside the biofilm. Uh, there has been some promising approaches, but nothing that has been translated clinically at this point. Again, nanoparticles for antibiotic delivery is something that is um, used more recently and has shown some promising results. We need to see what is coming down that pipeline. Contact materials, right? We talked about this. It's obviously, it's the contact active materials. It's using polymers to have that deliver some type of structure to prevent the adhesion and kill bacteria on, upon a, a contact, right? These contact active materials. Matt Becker, who's here at Duke, is doing quite a bit of this, looking at uh, these structures and surface modifications. Okay, going over to the past, uh, the last topic of this presentation is biofilm eradication using topical solutions. We, talked about this a little bit before. Uh, 
this is one of the structures that um, you know, one of the medications that's FDA approved gets distributed by 3M. It's called Plast X. If you look at this, it's something that is often used by podiatrists for chronic diabetic foot ulcers with biofilm formation. If you look at what's available, silver absorb, pontosan. If you look at next time product class X, the reduction, the, the lock reduction of bacteria, staph aureus and pseudomonas is uh, outstanding compared to all the other products that are available in this. And this is a, it's a 72 hour biofilm, so it's a fairly mature biofilm. Again, same experiment if you look at this. If you look at this compared to silver soap wound gel or other wound gels, if you look at the images on the left, control versus the Plast X versus the other modalities, it really does help. I use this particular product in my high-risk patients when I put, a, put it on the wound closure before I put a, a wound back on for a week and definitely helps with the prevention of bias information in that setting. Now, finally, the, the last two slides, we're going to go a little bit about irrigation solutions. There's a variety of irrigation solutions available. Irisept is a chlorhexidine product, pontosan, iodine, povidine. If you look at this, these are all available. Vash, hydrogen peroxide, acetic acid, or back to sure. Um, if you look at this in, in detail, the ones that uh, have been used more commonly is over on iodine, and this is a meta-analysis that shows there is really no difference between patients that had a biofilm or had irrigation with povidine iodine compared to normal saline. Um, I have gone away with this, especially with the FDA label warning using this. But the historical perspective on these antiseptics is this is not a new concept. That was published in, uh, you look at this in 1919 by uh, Sir uh, Alexander Fleming. So this is not a new concept. So I use for established biofilm um, infections the um, Irisept solution, which if you look at this uh, uh, compared to the most commonly used uh, solutions in the US, Irisept, which is chlorhexidine versus betadine, back to shore showed a much better efficacy against Staph aureus, ep Staph epididermidis, and E. fecalis. Uh, compared to the other products, and again, this has been shown in in several studies. This is this is uh, some data out of Montana State, looking at a biofilm model. Again, looking at Irisept Betadine, and you see the results with Bactisher. Um, I have had good results with this clinically using this, so this has been great. So again, this is this is um, Bactisher as a lavage, it's contact time, looking at clinical isolate versus normal saline shows a higher uh, efficacy in this. Uh, concluding with this presentation, the takeaways, biofilms are sessile microbial communities that are embedded in a matrix of extracellular polymeric substances, and they exhibit outside phenotypes that enhance their survival, make it much harder to treat. Um, biofilms are the, is, is the play a key role in prosthetic joint infections and make it really hard to treat for us and have disastrous consequences to patients and healthcare systems, particularly in healthcare dollars spent. It can be very difficult to diagnose uh, and therefore consequently very difficult to treat. Um, several me methods are being developed to work on the diagnostic side and to enhance that. Uh, penetrating antibiotics are rare. Um, they typically don't eliminate them. Uh, and so antibiotic treatment in itself is not uh, a great solution to treat these infections. Surgical treatment for biofilm is the main or the gold standard and should be combined with other modalities. Right. And then the biofilm in itself represents a significant challenge in treating these infections. So we went over a number of promising treatment modalities and, and concepts for the treatment of these infections. I know some of these are still in the early stages and are not ready for clinical use, but it's important to know that this is available. Uh, probably the most commonly cited ones and most exciting ones, in my opinion, are implant surface modification. Um, the new an antibiotics and uh, biofilm disrupting agents, um, interruption of uh, quantum 
sensing, signaling, vaccines, electrical stimulation, photodynamic therapy, contact active uh, biocidal materials are some of the newer ones. And uh, there is some active research done, but it's not as widespread as for the other modalities. And the next phase for most of these preventive treatments is reproducing their effects clinically. Uh, while they have shown promising results in a lab setting, in a bioreactor setting, uh, some of these did not uh, replicate the results in an animal model, nor did they make it to the clinical phase. Thank you.